This is WPSL Port St. Lucie. 606 right now at WPSL. We uh, proudly introduce a brand new program tonight entitled Issues and Answers in St. Lucie County. Hosted by Mark Gods. with a special guest tonight, County Commissioner Kathy Townsend. And of course, the program brought to you by the uh, School Development Group that you'll hear more about. Right now, here's your host, Mark Gotts. Welcome to Issues and Answers in St. Lucie County. My name is Mark Gotts, and I'll be your host for the show. We would like to examine the different issues that affect our community and have open discussions with guests on these issues. The format of the show is simple. The first half hour, we will discuss a subject or subjects with our invited guest. The second half hour will be open to calling questions on issues that you feel you need answers to. The phone number here is 772-340-1590. I am very pleased to present our first guest, County Commissioner Kathy Townsend. Kathy, good evening. Good evening. How are you? Thanks for having me. Oh, pleasure. You're a, uh, a first-term commissioner, and uh, I don't think you've run for office in the past. Is the job what you expected? Well, let's just get right to the chase, right? <laughs> <laughs> it, it is everything I expected, but there's also surprises that have come along with the job. Okay, what are some of the surprises? I mean, don't keep us in the, uh, in the dark. Well, I think, I think it is everything that I thought it was going to be. It's a public service, and that part I enjoy. The other part is I have been like every other constituent out there thinking, government red tape, why does it take so long? And I just thought me getting in, I was just going to expedite things and make everything happen, and it's been very disappointing to me, so I understand why it's disappointing to the residents and the businesses in St. Lucie County because it does take a lot of red tape and a long time to get something done. Things don't happen quickly, and that's discouraging. And I see why residents and people that really pa are passionate about the things that they want to have done or a business coming here or something, why it's discouraging to them because of the red tape and it takes so long to get stuff done. Do you think there's any way to uh, kind of cut through that red tape and make it easier for people to uh, open up new businesses and, and start construction in the county? I, I think there's still work to do. I, I We do have great staff, but I do still think that there needs to be some education and some follow through. And there are ways that we can still improve to expedite the process and to help hold hands of businesses wanting to come here. For example, if somebody was to come into the county and they didn't realize we had a business navigator and they were to go to the planning and zoning department and they wanted to open up something and it's a small business. There's not anybody really in there to walk them through a process, give them a punch out list and say, this is what you need to do. It's very frustrating for somebody that doesn't have a building background or a background in land development or site plans or engineering. So if you're somebody that you're driving up US-1 and you decide you want to open up a golf cart company, you find a building, the average person doesn't realize that it's important to do your due diligence. You know, somebody wanting to make a sale is going to tell you something, even though most realtors are very honest and there's protected laws. You can buy a building and not do your due diligence by going to the county and then go into that building after you've purchased it, levied your personal savings. And then it becomes very frustrating because you don't really know what to do. So you go to planning and zoning. They tell you this is what you need to do. But then you have to go to the health department for this. And depending on what business it is you want to get into, there's not somebody there as a little guy that's going to hold your hand and walk you through the process. And so you end up becoming frustrated. Then you halfway into it thousands of dollars later find out that there's a business navigator so one of the things that i would like to see is some way for there to be a message out there that when you come into st lucie county little or small that there is going to be somebody in our planning and development department that's going to introduce you to a business navigator or we have what we call planner of the day so when you come into the planning and zoning department the planner of the day sits there and they are there to fill any questions that come in that day. 
And more so than not, you don't stay with that planner. So you come in, you're doing due diligence. You come back six months later, three months later, however long it is. And now you have decided that you're going to come here. You're going to live here. You're going to have your business here. So you put a packet together and you walk in thinking you've done all your homework and you know what you really want to do. And you get there and you're assigned a planner. Then that planner tells you things and they're things that are different than what the planner of the day was. So to me, I feel to have continuity. Whoever you meet on your first time should be somebody that should follow it through. They should give you their contact information. You should walk out of there with a punch out list. You should be able to check off everything that when you come back, if it's 30 days, 60 days, whenever it is, when you come back, you have your list. You can ask for that person. And with the exception, if they've retired or moved on, you should be able to ask for that planner and that planner continue to walk you through the process. And you shouldn't have to go out there and hire somebody, a, a land development attorney or a land planner or something. It should be simple enough if you're a small business to be able to walk through the process with the planner and get you done and get you done and expedited. If it's a smaller thing and it's not going to require a zoning change or a site plan or something, it should be something that should be done in less than 45 days to 60 days because it's not going to have to go to planning and zoning board or the board of county commissioners it's going to be done in-house administratively and so those are some of the frustrations i think for some of the people small businesses wanting to come here i know it's a frustration for me more so than not eventually uh i do know that the people that are in my district they do end up finding my office and I'm able to help them walk through that process. So we still have work to do for improvement. Of course, in life, you can always improve. Well, I know as a, a real estate developer, it is a difficult situation when you go into a county, especially if you haven't been operating in the county previously, you know what the rules and regulations are, that they're all a little bit different no matter where you go. And I think a, a navigator and having someone who's going to guide you through that because when you're developing large pieces of property, your timeline on that, when it gets extended, costs you a lot of money because mm -hmm. usually there's an interest clock that's running just like the small business person putting their money into, uh, into the project that they want to do. So the uh, bouncing around in government agencies is something that frustrates many people both in business and in real estate development. Um, do you see any way of kind of creating a path with this navigator and maybe putting a requirement that uh, plans have a certain period of time that they have to be approved on so that when somebody comes in, whether it's a business or whether it's a real estate development, that they know that uh, by X, Y, Z, they're supposed to be through the initial process? Well, I think... So I'll use Maverick Boats as an example. Okay. That, that's a company that was here for a long time, and they wanted to expand. They came to the EDC, Economic Development Council, with Pete Tesh. Pete Tesh had them meet one-on-one -on -one with all the commissioners. And then the business navigator got involved, and we were able to actually push that through, expedite that through in two months. Now... You would think that a small little business that just wants to come here, you should be able to expedite something that rapid as well. So I think that one business navigator right now is sufficient. I, I don't think that we're that busy from a business perspective that he can't be out there doing all he can do. We have to somehow find a way to advertise him to let people know we have one. I think that's where we're failing right now. People do not really come to the county to do a due diligence and meet him, little or small. So if you're a big company, you get introduced to him because you also get involved with the Economic Development Council. So between the EDC, Economic Development, and the Business Navigator, you have that hand-holding. And you also, because you're large, you usually end up do having some type of a land planner involved with it. It's more the little mom-and-pop businesses that I think need to be their hands held a little bit more so. From a from a big development like you're referring to, those developers have land developers and they have engineers and they have landscaping engineers and they have a lot of people involved to make up the team. 
the little business is the one I'm more concerned about. Not that I'm not concerned about the big ones because I'm equally concerned. They both should be given the same treatment. So our business navigator that we have, he's great, I think, with the larger businesses. But the littler businesses is something that we need to address. And unfortunately, we are in the middle of budget right now. Mm -hmm. And that also comes in with planning and zoning. And so as we develop and get busier, we will have to look at bringing on more people. Maybe that's something in the future that we'll look at, that there will be like the assistant for the smaller businesses to the larger business navigator, and it can be a two-man department. That would make sense because being guided through the forest is very, mm-hmm. very important. And for small businesses, for people who have an idea and become entrepreneurial and you know a life savings or they borrow money on their house to get started, uh, they don't know all the pitfalls. And when they end up at the end of the day uh, trying to get open, have gone through most of the savings, it is a, a very frustrating uh, portion of being entrepreneurial. And one, it's scary for them, too, because – there is uh, there is a business actually that just did that. They leveraged their home to put out an SBA loan, small business loan, mm-hmm. and they use their home. And where they are currently, their lease is up, and so they purchased a building on US One that was an existing building, thinking it would be an easy transa- you know transition period. And they have had a lot of hurdles to overcome. And time is of the essence, and so there's a possibility that this company could potentially be shut down until they work through the issues of the building that they just purchased. So thankfully, they did contact the office, and I was able to put planning and zoning in place with the business navigator, introduce them, and what they need to do is all done in-house administratively. So we're going to be able to work that through for them. But had he not known that he could reach out to a county commissioner and get help, and that's one of the things I see often is, the frustrations of a small business, they don't realize that you can contact a county commissioner. Mm-hmm. And a commissioner can help you. People don't realize that. That's, a, that's interesting. On that subject, uh, I, I understand that you meet uh, once a month with citizens at one of the local libraries around, uh, around the county. And what are some of the issues your constituents contact you about, and how can they find out each month where you're going to be? So I do. That's correct. Thank you for noticing that. <laughs> I, I decided that when I was up on the dais, I was seeing people that were fearful of coming up to the microphone and talking. And I'm busy and I do five days a week. So I thought, how can I really reach out to the community and not be in a town hall meeting or something like that? So I decided that I was just going to go to a library, sit there, and anybody could just come up randomly and speak to me. So what I did is I reached out to the library services. I have a blog on my, if you go to St. Lucie County website, each commissioner, we have a site. And it's contact your commissioner. And I have a blog on that. So on that, I announce what library I'm going to next. That library then has a sign they post out front and they put a sign in the window. And then they let people know as they're leaving and checking out a book. So the first time I did it, there was one lady that showed up. Two had come in before I left. And after that, I've actually had people waiting for me when I've gotten to the libraries. So it's, it's, it, it's catching on. It's going very well. And I'm enjoying the libraries, too, because each library offers something different. And it's helping me realize the services that we offer from depending on what area of the county we're in. Well, that's interesting because most people are, are concerned about going up to a, a county commissioner uh, and speaking with them one-on-one with their problems. But uh, I think we're going to go to our first break, so Cliff. Our very first break from our very first show, the inaugural Issues and Answers in St. Lucie County with Mark Gott, our special guest, County Commissioner Kathy Townsend. They'll be right back. The Republican Party of St. Lucie invites you to meet your Republican candidates on Saturday, August 11th from noon till 4 p.m. at the Port St. Lucie Civic Center. Candidates from the school board to U.S. Congress and in between will be on hand. Come ask questions and get answers. No spin, no fake news, just you and the candidates. Get informed, be informed, vote informed. For more information, go to stlucygop.org. Paid for by the Republican Party of St. Lucie, not connected with any specific candidate. 
St. James Christian Academy is fully accredited and is now enrolling for fall, preschool through 12th grade, providing students with excellent education in a safe Christian environment for over 17 years. They offer dual enrollment, a Becca curriculum, transportation, affordable aftercare, STEM classes, sports, dance, and karate. St. James Christian Academy is now accepting fall enrollment applications. Plus, ask about their free tuition scholarships. Be a part of the excitement. Schedule a tour today or visit us at stjameschristianacademy.com. If as a woman you believe that you can accomplish all that a man can accomplish and more without the help of the government, you just might be a Republican. If you believe that you should have a say in your child's education and that you should have a choice as to where your child is educated, you just might be a Republican. To learn more, go to stlucygop.org and click on Being a Republican. This is WPSL Port St. Lucie, the talk of the Treasure Coast. Now, back to Issues and Answers in St. Lucie County with your host, Mark Gotts. Thank you, Cliff. I'm here with uh, County Commissioner Kathy Townsend, and we were discussing uh, her one-on-one -on -one with citizens at, uh, at local libraries and how uh, people can find out about that each month, which uh, she mentioned is on her blog. Uh, what are some of the things that have been discussed for, with the people who have approached you? So the last time I was at Lakewood Park, there actually it turned into a group. So there was a lady, there was a resident waiting on me when I got there. Two other people came in while I was there. They all sat down at the table. It actually went into after lunch. It was actually quite nice. And what their concerns were was the speeding in Lakewood Park. And there had been a dog killed. And they wanted to know what could be done to help with the speeding issues out there in the park. So I have a great relationship. I'm very blessed that um, I have um, good communication with the sheriff's department. Public safety is important. It's a priority. And I was able to reach out to them. They went out. They put up the flashing sign that alerts you. And then they went out there and they did radar for a while. And as you know, when you do radar, People know you're there radaring. It's only effective for a brief few days. After that, they know that you're there. But they stopped it for a while, and then they went back and did it again. And then they actually sent a report to the office letting me know how many tickets they issued. And the resident has actually contacted the office since then and said that it was uh, effective and that the speeding has quieted down and that the cars that were racing have not happened since they did do the radar so that was effective so that was just one issue that came up I know when I was at Morningside Library there was a lady there using the internet she was doing a resume another gentleman had come in he he saw my sign and he came over and started speaking to me and he was thanking me for the public library services because he doesn't have a computer and he has to go there to fill out job applications online she overheard our conversation then she started engaging in conversation and then that got into some housing help I put them in contact with Diana with our community housing and um, a relationship blossomed from that they were able to help the young lady get some housing mm -hmm. and then one of the gentlemen overheard the conversation had issues with uh, transportation so I was able to share with him the transportation system that we have here, which then prompted me to get on a bus the next week and hop on at our intermodal on Avenue D and take a trip to check out our transit system because I heard concerns at one of the library meetings. And so I was able to go back with transportation with Mariah and address some of the issues in the transportation from the buses. And then... You know, I, I'm really getting a lot of feedback from the people, and it's great because they've even said that, that they like the fact that they can just come in, sit down one-on-one -on -one in a library, and they're not intimidated by a microphone or a dais or knowing something's on TV. So it's going very well, and I think as time goes on, I have two more years in office. Hopefully, the meetings will become more and more, and I'll have to probably maybe pick up another day out of the month. But I'm, I'm, I've enjoyed getting to know the libraries. Because every library is so unique and so different. Lewis Library, we have a 3D printer. A lot of the people go there with their children because 
they use the 3D printer for their history projects for school and their science projects. A 3D printer. A 3D printer. In one of our libraries. In one of our libraries right here in St. Lucie County. We're, we're, we're leading. It's quite impressive, actually. You ought to go to the, you should go to the Paul Lewis Library on Rosser and look at it. It's very impressive. They actually have a room there that if you are a musician, you can do a, a demo tape. If you want to have a blog on YouTube, they have an area set up there that you can actually do your own blog. Don't even have to own a computer. You can actually go to the library, have your business on YouTube, and do your blog right from our libraries. Well, being a county commissioner sounds like a full-time job. I always thought that it was like a part-time job, but it sounds like you spend a lot of time there. And I know we've touched on uh, many of the things that you do, but uh, what exactly does a county commissioner do when they're not talking to the public? What is the behind the scenes with staff? And I know that uh, we're, we're getting into budget time now, and uh, that's very important. Uh, what, do you, what do you see responsibilities there? Well, the first priority is public service. You have to be accessible. And they say it's a part-time job, but it's not. I do five 10-hour days, and on Saturdays I'm at ribbon cuttings and groundbreakings and Habitat for Humanity, house dedications, nonprofit fundraising. On Sundays, I still take calls and return text and emails. So it's a a seven-day-a-week job if you take it serious. And I am amazed even now that I'm 17, 18 months in, people actually say, so what exactly does a county commissioner do? And it's an interesting question. So, yes, we do. We, We do the budget. There are departments that the county has, and we have to decide from the taxes that come in where the funds are going to go. And you have to look at each budget, each department, line items to us once a year. And we're in that process right now. We started today. Mm -hmm. We met today for the first time to go over the beginning of the budget. And then once we hash through a lot of it, then there's two readings and it takes place in the chambers on the dais. So some of the some of the things that a county commissioner does is we do budget, and the budget is over the infrastructure, your roads, your sidewalks, your swales. Um, it's over public safety, which is your sheriff's department, environmental, the community, economic development, recreation, parks and rec, you know, our, our fairgrounds and so on, and then management. We have facilities. So the county has buildings. We have custodial services that go in and clean, and then we have to maintain those facilities as well. So like the jail, that's a county facility. However, it's ran through the sheriff's department, but we still have to provide the services and the manpower to do the work out there. The libraries, that's a county building. So some of the libraries right now are not open on Monday. Mm -hmm. So that's another concern that some of the constituents have had is they want the libraries opened on Monday. So that was something that was discussed today in budget is the funding there to go ahead and bring forward reopening up the libraries on monday i can't say that that's going to happen i can just say that it was in conversation today so we we do ordinances if you're developers we talked about earlier you have to go to planning and zoning planning and zoning then takes that to a planning and zoning board that's an advisory board each commissioner points one resident of the community to that board and then they hash everything out and then they bring it to us and we don't have to agree with them we can disagree with them but we are the final approval of that site plan but there's still things that are passed throughs and unfunded mandates that come down to us and I know a lot of people don't really realize what an unfunded mandate is so I'll use an example is uh, with the recent shootings in schools um, Tallahassee decided that after that happened that it had to be expedited and a school resource officer needed to be in every school. So we have already done the budget for 2018 and now we're doing budget for 2019. So that is top priority, public safety. You can't compromise public safety, let alone our loved, you know, our children. And so we are having to find the funds to fund the school resource officers with the sheriff's budget that he already has so he has come back and asked for more money and that is part of the negotiations that's being done right now so we we do the budget we do ordinances we do site plans we walk people through the process of uh issues i get garbage calls and i have to call waste pro and they take care of your garbage issue 
There's ribbon cuttings, you know, whenever there's a new business opening up and they invite you to come do a ribbon cutting, you go to a ribbon cutting. It, there's a lot of there's a lot of job duties involved in being a county commissioner. Yes, on that school issue, uh, I know that the uh, state government uh, allocated four hundred million dollars at the end of the session, uh, and eighty seven or ninety seven million of that was to go for school resource officers. It's interesting that the the sheriff needs an increase in his particular budget, uh, even though these dollars were allocated to the school districts. And uh, I believe uh, St. Lucie County School District received $1.3 million, I believe, towards funding for these SROs. Has that been taken into account with these extra dollars that the sheriff wants? Well, it has and it hasn't. So the that is correct. It was $1.2, and it was allocated to the school board. The school board and the county commissioners need to have conversation. As it was discussed today as well, that the board also would like to have conversation with the cities because the cities may be willing to fund some of the police officers into the schools to alleviate some of the burden from the county. So this is some of the stuff that people don't understand, you know, because you have the county and you have the unincorporated county, which is ran by the sheriff's department. And then you have your cities, which is protected through your police department. Some of the schools are located within the city limits. Some of the conversation with some of the board members have said that they would be willing to entertain and look at and discuss possible funding for the police department. So this is all conversation that has to happen. I can't say how that's going to end up. I just know that we are open for conversation and the conversation will happen. I I do feel that we can come to the table, I think, and I think that we all agree that it is a priority. You mm -hmm. cannot compromise safety in any form, let alone with our children. So I don't have children. You don't have children at school anymore, but I have grandbabies, and I want to protect them as well. So it's it's conversation that we're going to have to have, and, and it was requested today for us to have a meeting with the cities to discuss that as well. So Is the school board going to be part of that meeting, uh, added yes. to that meeting? Yes, it'll be the school board and then the board with the city of Fort Pierce and the school board with the city of Port St. Lucie, I'm as well as the sheriff's department. I'm assuming that'll be an open meeting? Yes. Okay. And just a reminder to our audience that uh, we are now open for phone calls. So anyone who would like to call with an issue, uh, the number is 772-340-1590. We'd love to take your issue and uh, bounce it around with uh, Commissioner Kathy Townsend. Um, the uh, education issue here with uh, safety has, is something that's really jumped out uh, across the board uh, throughout the country, actually, and um, probably do a show on that by itself. Um, so with all you're doing as a county commissioner, where do you have any time to get any R&R? &R? Well, I actually had my first Sunday that I was free yesterday since I've been in office. It was quite nice. Until Although I called I, you. It, yeah, that's correct. You did call me to see if I would do the show with you, and we had conversations. But I actually it, – it's very important, I think, for you to have boundaries. Um, you know, you're not going to be in office forever. Your family is forever. So I'm, I'm fortunate that both my sons are self-employed. My husband is running our company right now because we do have a company. So they're equally as busy as I am. And so when I decided to run – I had that conversation with my children and my husband and the seasons were just in line right now for my family for me to be where I am. I, I don't believe I'm going to be a long term um, politician because, like I said, it's very frustrating at times. I, I, I don't know what the future holds. I mean, I say I'm not long term, but I might be here 20 years from now. Who knows? But you do have to have a balance and you have to have time and the priorities do need to be your family because it can consume all of you. I was in the office till eight o'clock Friday night just trying to wrap things up because I knew that we were going to be in budget this week. And I was gone the week prior to a conference in, ta in um, Orlando. So I was doing late nights to try to get caught up on that, too. So. Yeah, you, you have to have a balance. <laughs> well, the budget is always something that the citizens of St. Lucie County are concerned about because obviously it's our tax money, and uh, we've worked hard for that tax money and giving it to the county. Uh, you know, we're looking for some specific services, 
uh, safety obviously being the major issue there, and we've discussed that. Uh, you know, clean water, sewer, and I think uh, there's been some discussion, I guess, today about some discharges with Lake O. I don't know whether you're up to speed on that or not, but uh, I know we've been working on that particular issue for quite some time, and it seems like we really haven't gotten any closer to solving it. So have you, have you got any thoughts on that particular issue as far as water? Well, I think when you start talking about water, that's a whole other show. It's very um, in-depth. I will, t- I will tell you that I'm born and raised Floridian, and the water problems actually started when Disney went in. Mm-hmm. Um, when they went in up in the Orlando area, they changed the drainage. And coming out of the Kissimmee River is what rerouted everything and pushed things around. And so that's when a lot of the issues were created. Mm-hmm. I think we're all mindful of it, and I think when we have exceptionally hot summers, you see more of the algae blooms than you do in an off year that's not as hot, although every summer's hot in Florida. But until we can address some of the septic tanks up in Cocoa that still have asbestos on them, they're very old around the, the, the military base up there. So we have a lot of issues, and I think we have so many people on so many different pages That until we all come together and realize that it's not just one entity, it's not just sugar, it's not just septic tanks, it's it's multiple of things, and we have to all come together as one and unify, and we have to compromise. Uh, The South Florida Water Management, I know, takes a lot of heat for that, and South Florida Water Management is not the one that really discharges. They are dictated to by the Army Corps of Engineers, and the Army Corps tells them when they need to release the, mm-hmm. the water from the lake, and a lot of people don't realize that, nor do they want to believe that for those that have been told that. So there's a lot of issues that play into this. You've got fertilizer runoff. You've got compost from your ag lands, from your cow manure. You've got the, your water district, you know, St. Lucie Village, your your, so, your south and north Hutchinson Island, your river communities with their fertilizer. The county did implement a fertilizer um, ordinance, ordinance right? as well as St. Lucie Village and the cities did. So that helps. You have your, you have your North Fork Water District and your Fort Pierce Farms Water District, which was designed to help drain off your ag lands. But you do still have contamination coming off of the ag land so it's a multiple of things and I really don't know what the answer is I really don't know how we're going to fix it I'm mindful of it and I do want to work with people and I'm open to suggestions when they have them but I and I think we are closer now than we were two years ago or than we were five years ago we are a little I do feel that we are getting closer and people are becoming more educated so I think instead of pointing fingers at people, though, we need to come together as a whole, and we have to reach compromise, and we have to find out a way to fix it. I know that there is some land being bought south of us, and they are trying to take it back to the original drainage part of how it used to drain through the Everglades. South Florida Water Management is dealing with the reservoirs and the stations to try to clarify and clean up the water before it's discharged back out again. So we have moved ahead, but we still have a long way to go. Well, it's an issue that's been down here for quite some time, and, and I'm sure it'll going to be, continue to be an issue. Let's go to our second break, Cliff, and this is Issues and Answers in St. Lucie County with our special guest, Kathy Townsend. And we'll be right back. If as a woman you believe that you can accomplish all that a man can accomplish and more, Without the help of the government, you just might be a Republican. If you believe that you should have a say in your child's education and that you should have a choice as to where your child is educated, you just might be a Republican. To learn more, go to stlucygop.org and click on Being a Republican. St. James Christian Academy is fully accredited and is now enrolling for fall 
preschool through 12th grade, providing students with excellent education in a safe Christian environment for over 17 years. They offer dual enrollment, a Becca curriculum, transportation, affordable aftercare, STEM classes, sports, dance, and karate. St. James Christian Academy is now accepting fall enrollment applications. Plus, ask about their free tuition scholarships. Be a part of the excitement. Schedule a tour today or visit us at stjameschristianacademy.com. The Republican Party of St. Lucie invites you to meet your Republican candidates on Saturday, August 11th from noon till 4 p.m. at the Port St. Lucie Civic Center. Candidates from the school board to U.S. Congress and in between will be on hand. Come ask questions and get answers. No spin, no fake news, just you and the candidates. Get informed, be informed, vote informed. For more information, go to stlucygop.org. Paid for by the Republican Party of St. Lucie, not connected with any specific candidate. This is WPSL Port St. Lucie, the talk of the Treasure Coast. Welcome back to Issues and Answers. St. Lucie County. Once again, here's Mark Gotts. Thank you. You got a phone call. Thank you, Kip. Cliff, we got our first phone call. That's interesting. Hey, John. Good, morning. Good afternoon, John. John, you want to go ahead? Oh, you're going to play the music. Okay. okay. The music's got a sorry track for us. Okay, can you hear me now? Well, we can hear uh, you vaguely. all along. Yes. I couldn't hear you because it was all music. Okay. And anyway, the question is for Commissioner Townsend. Go ahead. Uh, are you? Um, do you have any control over the, uh, the traffic and the traffic lights in the uh, city of Port St. Lucie? Do you have any influence there? No, sir, I don't. But I can tell you that the city of Port St. Lucie uh-huh. has a program in place and they are synch- they're synchronized so if you if you are at a red light and it turns green if you do the speed limit you should be able to go from one part of port st lucie to the other part of port st lucie without catching a red light as long as you do the speed limit it's called the green traffic system i believe yeah, is what they're calling it and yeah. it's been tested and yeah. it was also tested out in st lucie west during the mets games yeah. Are you well, having I, a? I, I've been here 29 years. I've been in the same house 29 years, and for the last 10 years, I've been asking them why do, they don't uh, synchronize the lights, time them so that if you're doing the speed, you know, not the normal speed limit, that you 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 do get every light until you come to a red light, you know. Because for the longest time, it was green light to red light, green light to red light. But what they my complaint is that um, um, they they're experimenting with traffic flow and originally opposite directions would, would both make turns left turns we'll say and uh and then they they now they've changed it so that one side does a left turn and then the traffic goes forward and then when that stops the opposite direction goes forward and that their turn is still waiting and then after a while, they can make a left turn, and the, the traffic backs up for a quarter of a mile. I mean, it's ridiculous. You know, my my only route to St. Lucie West is Prima Vista across Bayshore, and I'm I'm backed up to I don't know if you know where the Family Dollar is. Yes, sir, I do. But I'm I'm st- I'm there every day, two, two three times a day, and by the time I get to the the green light, I have already sat through two lights. John, you are. Uh, do you live in St. Lucie West? No, I'm on the poor side of the tracks. I'm I'm east of uh, Bayshore. All right, I'm you're behind, east of Bayshore. Behind, I know the yeah. I know the system that you're talking about. Uh, we've got it in St. Lucie West, and basically, uh, they call it the smart light system. This is something uh-huh. that that I have argued about uh, in front of the city council, as yeah. a matter of fact, a couple of weeks ago, because uh, I've been a driver for longer than I'd care to say, sure. and as you mention how traffic normally flows this is the way it is in the rest of the world but in st lucie west with this smart light system it does exactly what you're saying it is not consistent 
You don't get the turn lines first. Uh, one side will go through. Sometimes all four sides will go through at different times. You never know when you're going to get a turn light. It is a terrible system. I don't understand it. I can't figure it. You know, I want to tell you something. When I first came here uh, back in 89, I was listening to PSL, and they had, uh, I think it was uh, the Humane Society on or something, and they were talking about the plight of the manatee. And I, and I called up, and I don't call stations often, but I called up and I said, you know, if they would have put a, a guard around the propeller, like a nose guard on a football helmet, I think it would save a lot of the manatees from being cut up by the propeller. And they said, oh, that's a terrific idea. Gee, you know, I wonder why no one ever, I'm going to look into it and I'll get back. Of course, I never heard from them again, you know. Well, that's, but, that's um, normal. That's, uh, yeah. that's usually what happens. Yeah. It is, it is a good idea, but it may not just be functional. Okay, well, so yeah. let, me, let me just say this. I will reach out tomorrow to the city of Port St. Lucie. If you would like to leave a phone number, I'm happy to give your name and phone number to the mayor or one of the council members there and have them call you. I do know that they did have you know, issues. I and I'm happy to call them and then leave the uh, message for them to contact you. You know, I, I, I know Greg Orovec, uh, Mayor Orovec, and uh, he's a real nice guy, decent guy. And I mentioned it to him, and he said, well, actually, the traffic moves 90, per second, 90 seconds uh, faster now. And I said, not, not where I am, you know. <laughs> you... And, and I, want, I want to tell you something. There's a street here called Kilpatrick and Heather Street. And since I've been here, there's been... I know four deaths I, that I know of, and perhaps five, because there was just a couple within the last month or so. And and I talked with somebody in traffic years ago, and because there's only there's only two stop signs, and they they come by uh, on Mary on uh, Kilpat Kilpatrick probably doing around 45, 50, and they all, and people go through the stop sign and they collide. It's a shame, because, you know. Uh, blood all over the place and they do you think they'd put four stop signs okay so i can help you with that so on the 19th i believe it's the 19th of this month there is going to be a meeting addressing just what you're saying there is some people on prima vista Uh and there are some side streets that traffic is being pushed off onto and so they are looking at putting in a roundabout there Oh, geez. Oh, to okay. slow down and so what they're wanting is they're wanting the residents to show up for this meeting to address mm-hmm. if it should be four-way stops or if it should be roundabouts and mm-hmm. so i have your phone number from when you called into the station i'm not going to repeat yeah, it on I, the air because, i went ahead and give it to her john yeah because john i know you don't want all these sexy women calling you whenever we I put think, your yes he does yeah, okay oh, so what i'm going to do is I will have my aide call you tomorrow and give you the exact date and time. I want to think it's the 19th, but I'm not sure. And you you should attend that meeting because it's for the residents addressing just what you said. And yeah. then I will also pass your name and phone number on unless you would like to reach out to Mayor Orvac or the city and address and let them know that they're not synchronized on, on Prima Vista. And... You well, can take that up with them, but I'm also happy to give them your phone number and your name if you'd like me to do that, too. And then please attend that meeting because it's going to be addressing exactly what you just brought up about that. Okay. Well, good. I appreciate it. Thank I, you very much. I appreciate you taking the time to call in. Thanks so much. Have a great night. Yeah, John, thank you very much. Thank you. Public yeah. safety is the major issue of what government is supposed to respond to its citizens. Well, you've had your first call now. Maybe, maybe the second one, a second one will come in uh, before the end of the show. We still got ten minutes left. Three, well, four, if, we got, if we've got ten minutes, then uh, we certainly have time to go back to uh, taxes, which is one of my favorite subjects. Um, any ta- chance of a, a of a tax increase this year, or are we looking at staying status quo? Or what are your what are your thoughts on that, Commissioner? Well, I can't give you that answer because we're in budget. And it does have two public hearings. And because of sunshine and ethics, and one of the commissioners might be listening to this show, I have to be very cautious to, as to what, I can, what I'm going to say. However, I can tell you that I will not be voting for a tax increase. I have asked that the taxes stay the same. I think that the departments put in their wish list 
and we have done really good, I think, at giving the departments what they need. I think that we are going to be okay. We are mindful of the needs of the other departments. I personally feel that the millage rate will stay the same this year. I can't say that that's going to happen. I'm one of five. You need to have two more votes, but I, I will not be voting for a tax increase. We also are addressing the sales tax. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you have a lot of, a lot of things moving forward and we have a lot of amendments coming up and we have the two homestead amendments. We have the sales tax amendment. So we're, what we're hoping for in a perfect scenario is that the new homestead, which would be your third exemption fails and the sales tax passes. That would be a perfect scenario. And if that happened, St. Lucie County would be in really great shape within the next 10 years. However, you have to plan for the worst. And so in planning for the worst, we're trying to kind of split it down the middle and say, the homestead's probably going to pass, and we're hoping and hopeful that the sales tax passes. So then that will offset the revenue loss when the homestead passes. We'll lose $8 million, but we'll make that up with the sales tax. So then it will be a wash, and we'll still be in the position that we're in right now to be able to just maintain the millage rate, leave it the same. Right, but that sales tax is going to be earmarked, right, supposedly for, for roads in the lagoon? Well, it's earmarked for infrastructure, which is your uh, roads, culverts, and water control. So water control being cul it could be culverts. Like mm -hmm. we have a lot of collapsed culverts right now on, for an example, Edwards Road. Edwards Road actually started from damage from the hurricane. And what we thought was a very small hole, okay. we've now realized it's tunneled a minimum of at least six feet under. We don't know how wide it is. We're going in with cameras. That's going to be probably close to a four or five million dollar project because we're having to shut down the whole road at Edwards now. So, the the sales tax would fix that. We have culverts that are bad out west of town. So, the water, the 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 water part of the sales tax is to address water issues should they arise, but it's also to address some of the culverts that are collapsed, the bridge mm -hmm. on Old Dixie mm -hmm. going over the Taylor Creek, uh, that that's shut down right now. So that's a water issue because it's a bridge going over the water. The, the, the comfort I have in this is that it's an advisory board, just like we have an advisory board in planning and zoning. And so the uh, constituents making up of that board will decide where the funds should be allocated to in priority mm -hmm. and then it comes to the board to be passed and there's a 10-year sunset on it so it's not supposed to be for salaries or anything like that so i'm hopeful that it you know there will be the accountability there in the sunset in 10 years okay. and so for those two things i have some level of comfort with this and i believe in giving it to the people and allowing them to decide what they want to do. I don't think as a board we should decide on this sales tax. I think the sales tax should be decided by the people. And that's why it is on the ballot for and the 20th. That's why it is on the ballot. So. And our neighboring <clears throat> counties in Martin and Okeechobee are already at 7%. So mm -hmm. that would put us in, in line with um, our neighboring counties. Well, we have another call uh, from Mike. Uh, Cliff, you want to put him through? He's right. He's right here with you. Mike, go ahead. Welcome to the show. I'm a neighbor of yours, Mark, in Port St. Lucie, I might add. I have a big question about impact fees. What would possess anyone running for office to vote in favor of impact fees and raising them? Okay, so I can answer that question. Um, I am not in favor of impact fees. I'm not in favor of passing them. I actually have been... Um, very vocal about that. I don't know if you watch the Board of County Commissioner meetings, but you can go back and watch some of them. About six months ago, it was brought before us, and they wanted to increase them. And we have been able to postpone that. And when they tried to bring them back again, they were postponed again. And it's not something that's in discussion right now. I, I do have a lot of concerns and a lot of issues, and personally, I, I I understand why we need impact fees. I understand that. I just think they're way out of line. 
we've made it so that it's impossible for a homeowner to have a lot or property and to go in and build. And so if you're a developer, you have money, okay? You're going to pass that on to the homeowner. So if, if you have five acres west of town and you want to go build a house, you're going to pay $20,000 in impact fees. But if Mr. Smith is a developer, he's going to pay $20,000 in impact fees, but he's going to tack that onto the price of the house. Somebody coming in, not understanding what the impact fees are or what they're made up of, they're going to go in, they're going to see a house in a development, they're going to buy a house for $300,000, it's new, they're going to pick out their carpet and their blinds and their paint, they're going to think they're getting a really good deal. But what it's doing is it's hurting the real estate market and it's hurting the people that want to downsize. They've bought property or two and three generations that have inherited property. We have made it so that it is not cost effective to be able to go in and build. So from a development point also, they shift some of those impact fees because you do road improvements. So there, I have a lot of concerns and issues. So I can't tell you about the other four commissioners, but Mike, I can tell you that I'm not a proponent of impact fees, um, especially on an individual residential homeowner. I think, I think that it's hindering um, our residents from building. I'm one of them. I have property west of town and I'd like to build a downsize and I have not done it simply because of that reason. Yes, God, Mike. God bless. We need more people to vote your way. <laughs> Thank you. I can understand those impact fees. I'm trying to do a house myself and uh, in the city of Port St. Lucie, and the impact uh, for a single-family house is going to be around $30,000. <clears> That's before I can even put a shovel in the ground. So uh, it is a concern. You know, we question why we don't have affordable housing in many areas and uh, this is one of the things that impacts uh, value of properties uh, both negatively and in and, and cases positively. And, and Mike I can also say that you do have impact fees with your school board and your fire department. We do not decide on that impact fee. I can tell you that last year the fire department did come forward with an impact fee. I, I did not support that raise of the impact fee however it did pass the rest of the board so we don't really decide on the impact fee for school and fire it's just a pass though on us but we have to have the final approval on it so those are other you have your county impact fee you have your city impact fee and then you have your county and school impact fee so if you live in a city and you want to build a home you could be looking at close to thirty thousand dollars to build a residential home crazy crazy, crazy stuff yeah. It is crazy. I'm, I'm going to stay homeless. I'll hang up and listen to you guys. Mike, thank you very, very much for the call. You well, we're winding up our first show, and I'd like to thank Commissioner Townsend for joining us tonight. Um, for our audience out there, please join us every Monday night from 6 to 7 to address your issues of concern and try to find answers. I hope that uh, the show tonight... It's been good. Kathy, you want to say something in closing? I, I would. I, I just want to say that I'm one of five, and I do try to go out there and be proactive, and I can't do it alone. So I love it when people call the office, when they email, when they see me in the grocery store. It, I need your help to be eyes and ears, and I can't do this alone. So continue to follow my Facebook page. Continue to follow me on the blog. Continue to reach out to me so that together we can just get things done. Thanks for having me. Citizens, you have your marching orders. Be well and have a great week. You've been listening to the inaugural presentation of Issues and Answers in St. Lucie County with Mark Gotts. A special guest tonight, County Commissioner Kathleen Townsend. Listen in every Monday evening in the 6 o'clock hour for the all-new Issues and Answers in St. Lucie County on WPSL Port St. Lucie. The talk of the Treasure Coast. <laughs>